The history of cocktail. Before Europeans settled in America, they had been cultivating beverage traditions for centuries. Interestingly, the distillates produced with fermented grape and grain mash were also revered for their medicinal qualities, and came be known as aqua vitae in Latin, eau de vie in French, uscubor in Gaelic, and water of life in English. The early colonists were voracious experimenters, on pumpkins, parsnips, turnips, rhubarbs, walnuts, elderberries, and more. Applejack was also popular because it could be made without the use of expensive distilling equipment. Fermented apple juice, or hard cider as it was called, was left out in the cold in late fall and early winter. As layers of ice formed on the surface of the cider, they were skimmed off, removing the water content and this concentrating the alcohol in the remaining liquid. As early as 1571, a Spanish doctor named Nicolas Menards published a document describing plants and medicines from the Americas that were being assimilated into daily life all over Europe. In Italy and France, these plants eventually found their way into fortified and flavored wines, such as vermouth and other aperitif wines. Ironically, these products made their way full circle across the Atlantic, where they later played a pivotal role in the growth of the cocktail tradition. That cocktail tradition began with rum. Distilling spirits began commercially in the New World in 1640 when Wilhelm Kieft, the Director General of New Amsterdam, now Manhattan, erected the first still in which to distill gin and a tavern in which to sell it. The production of rum fueled the growing economy. By 1733 it surpassed all other exports from the colonies. In retribution, the British passed the Molasses Act of 1733 to control and tax the flow of molasses into the colonies. The Sugar Act followed, and then in 1765 the Stamp Act, which required the use of a tax stamp on all transactions. If you ambled into a colonial New England inn for a cold one, or just as likely a hot one, you'd probably order a ratafia, shrub, turnip wine, posset, pope, bishop, sack, flip, or an ale. They were the progenitors of the cocktail, which made its official debut in print in 1806 in a publication called The Balance and Columbian Repository. In a letter to the editor, a reader had queried the meaning of a new word, cocktail, the editor wrote back, cocktail is a stimulating liquor, composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water and bitters. It is vulgarly called a bittered sling and is supposed to be an excellent electioneering potion, inasmuch as it renders the heart stout and bold, at the same time that it fuddles the head. Native Americans taught the early settlers how to use indigenous plants for flavorings in beverages and for medicinal purposes. The first commercially produced bitters was probably Peychaud's, made by Antoine Amédie Peychaud, a Creole immigrant to New Orleans who operated a pharmacy on the French Quarter's Royal Street from around 1793 through the 1830s. Peychaud himself made his bitters on a small scale but in 1840 the product was manufactured and sold nationally and internationally. With his background as an apothecary, Peychaud was a natural mixologist who delighted the friends who gathered for late-night revelry at his pharmacy. Peychaud would mix cognac and a dash of his secret bitters for his guests in a two-sided egg cup called a coquetier, pronounced coq it is very likely that this word evolved into the word cocktail in English, but there are countless other tales with the same claim. Regardless of what Peychaud called his concoction, it evolved into the anise-scented Sazerac Sons absinthe, of course. The transition from rum to whiskey was well underway long before the British again tried to choke off America's molasses supplies. Later, Hamilton's heavy tax on spirits drove many distillers out of the colonies altogether and to the frontier territories that would become Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Indiana. Depending on the distance and the water level of streams and rivers, the barrels of whiskey were sometimes in transit for many months. Completely by accident, whiskey makers discovered the benefits of barrel aging. It was also at this time, around 1833, that the word bourbon first appeared on whiskey labels, a tribute to the French who fought side by side with Americans in the Revolution. The Golden Age. When the war with Britain ended in 1815, spirits were heavily taxed again to pay for the war, but not for too long. 
In 1817, with the debt settled, all excise taxes on domestic spirits were repealed, and for over 40 years up until the Civil War. The spirits industry enjoyed a tax-free growth period. This finally set the stage for what would become known as the Golden Age of the Cocktail. Bars and saloons flourished during this period. In 1832, the Pioneer Inns and Taverns Law created a new type of license that allowed inns to serve alcoholic beverages without being required to lease rooms. The floodgates were now open. The Industrial Revolution that swept the Western world in the 19th century had a powerful impact on every facet of American life, and the alcoholic beverage industry benefited greatly. Factories lured people to urban centers around the country and fostered a sea change in the way people ate and drank and gathered. As cities grew larger, restaurants without inns became an important part of the urban landscape. Like the colonists before them, these new Americans brought with them their distilling and brewing skills and their love of the communal tradition of the public house and taproom. The new immigrants typically lived in the worst areas of these urban centers. But many prospered by creating their own social clubs, stocked with gallons of illegal spirits that they occasionally sold to the neighborhood at large. These unlicensed establishments were a phenomenon referred to as blind pigs or blind tigers. The gimmick was that you paid a certain amount of money to see the blind pig, and as a bonus you were served a free drink. The goal of these wily merchants, of course, was to get enough people to pay to see the pig so that they could open legit establishments. These neighborhood bars and saloons, often two or three to a block, were central to community and precinct politics, serving as community living rooms where men gathered to talk politics. The emergence and popularity of neighborhood bars in New York had the blessing of Tammany Hall, the city's notorious political machine. The political bosses of the day were happy to grant the Irish and German immigrants licenses to operate saloons, not for the financial return but because they could control the ward politics by controlling the saloons, where for the most part the voting males spent their free time. With time, the saloon owners became the power brokers in the precincts. By the 1870s, the bar business was big business, in full swing, and cocktail books and manuals were flooding the market. Cocktail bars of every description were flourishing in the big cities, from neighborhood haunts to the fancy palaces in big hotels. This was the height of the cocktail's golden age, when many of the classics were either born or perfected, the martini, the Manhattan, the sour, the fizz, the old-fashioned, the pousse cafe, the sling, and the julep. Many remain classics today. This was the era of the consummate professional, the barman. Service became as important as what was being served. The competition was intense, with bars opening on every corner. What separated success from failure was quality and service. In his 1888 Bartender's Manual, Harry Johnson wrote a chapter entitled How to Attend Bar, in which he chides the novice to supply ice water immediately with every drink, to mix drinks above the counter where the guest can see, and to mix them in such a way as to be neat, clean, and scientific. He also says that professionalism affords a bit of showmanship when he instructs to mix in such a way as to draw attention. Finally, Johnson instructs the bartender to be a caring friend, if you think a guest is about spending for a beverage, when it is possible that he or his family needs the cash for some other more useful purpose, it would be best to give him advice rather than a drink, and send him home with an extra quarter instead of taking the dime for a drink from him. Prohibition and Repeal Early into the 20th century, however, teetotalers were gaining momentum across the country to kill the production and sale of liquor. By 1912, prohibition was already in place in many states. Then in 1919, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was passed, and prohibition became the law of the land, outlawing the sale of alcohol in every way, shape, and form. In retrospect, prohibition is universally acknowledged to have been a gigantic failure. Speakeasies, the nickname for covert bars and private clubs where liquor could be found, not only flourished, they thrived. Even city officials and policemen were involved in the ruse of abstinence. 
but while booze continued to flow, and cocktails remained a staple of society, the profession of barman suffered immensely. It was no longer a respectable position to tend bar, or at least one could not discuss it publicly. Because many bars were makeshift, if you could call them bars at all, the arena for showmanship and excellence proved futile, and practically disappeared. By the time Prohibition ended in 1932, two generations had passed, and the image of the bartending profession was badly tarnished by organized crime's control of bars and speakeasies. Of course after Prohibition there was great demand for bartenders, but the level of craftsmanship and respect for the profession as a serious pursuit had wanted. One of the few pre-Prohibition bartenders who returned after repeal was Patrick Gavin Duffy, who worked at the Ashland House in New York City. He became one of the most respected bartenders of his day, credited with having created the first highball in the 1890s, by mixing whiskey with club soda over ice in a tall glass. Though the recovering liquor industry was glad to see Prohibition go, repeal proved to be another series of obstacles, many of them still in place today. Under new laws, individual states and even the individual counties within states were granted enormous power over the alcohol industry. The results were a Byzantine maze of local laws and regulations that make doing national business in the liquor industry a nightmare. Some states require liquor to be served only in small 50 ml airline or nip bottles, which basically discourages cocktails that require a dash of this or a half a shot of that. In other states, customers have to buy whole bottles of booze, and then leave behind the remainder if they can't finish. And rigorous registration procedures for individual brands severely limit the range of spirits available in many states simply because of too much red tape. States like Pennsylvania and Washington own the liquor stores, and choice of brands is made by state authority. This leads to a death of smaller brands that don't sell in volume and that dramatically impacts on the cocktail possibilities. Bartenders returning to the trade, or just getting started, were put at a severe disadvantage by these laws. And the Great Depression didn't help energize the business, either. Perhaps the proverbial bottom of the barrel was hit, however, during the peacetime era of the 50s, when cocktails suffered the ultimate insult, time-saving measures for a go-go society. Pre-prepared and processed food products designed to make life easier flooded the market, TV dinners, baby formula, Kool-Aid, Jiffy Pop, and Tang were the rage. Americans happily abandoned the fresh and natural, scooping up all that was processed and canned. The cocktail bar was not spared. Pre-sweetened, artificially flavored sweet and sour mixes, in the form of liquids or powders, made the scene. A product called 7-Eleven Tom Collins Powdered Mix, developed in the 30s, heralded the beginning of the end of the fresh fruit cocktails of the pre-prohibition era. Then, after World War II, several more of these products flooded the market, and a generation of bartenders learned the Kool-Aid style of making drinks, ice, liquor, water, and the mix. A return to the classic cocktail. Though James Bond championed the vodka martini in the 60s, it wasn't until the late 80s that the rebirth of the cocktail really took shape. In 1985 I went to work for legendary restaurateur Joe Baum at a fine restaurant in Manhattan called Aurora. Joe was the first president of Restaurant Associates, a company that operates restaurants and institutional food service outlets throughout the United States and abroad. When Joe took over the company in the 50s, America was a meat and potatoes country with iceberg lettuce and Tommy Tucker dinners thrown in for the kids. Joe began a series of bold innovations that over the years had a huge impact on the way Americans ate and drank. He started in the 50s with the Newicker at Newick Airport in New Jersey, the first fine dining restaurant in an international airport, that was followed in 1959 by the Four Seasons restaurant in New York City's Seagram Building, considered by many to be one of the first world-class American restaurants. Then, in 1960, Baum single-handedly introduced tequila to New York at La Fonda del Sol, where his innovative cocktail program included pisco, soyas, batidas, margaritas, and one that's experiencing a rebirth today, the Mojito Criollo. 
In 1987, Joe afforded me the opportunity to play an important role in reviving the great American cocktail. At the newly restored Rainbow Room, atop the Art Deco masterpiece at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Joe was determined to implement his dream of a 19th century style bar that used all fresh ingredients and no mixers. When Joe explained his plan for a beverage program that utilized only fresh juices with no commercial mixes, I gently complained that if the bar were very busy, it might be difficult to maintain the fresh squeezed routine. Joe snapped back that it had been done for a hundred years, and if I couldn't figure out how to do it, he would find someone who could. So I enthusiastically replied, I think it's a great idea, and I know we'll have no problem with it. But there were problems with it. As it was, I used fresh juice only to enhance an occasional margarita or whiskey sour to accommodate a demanding guest. Like most young bartenders back then, I relied on mixes not just as a shortcut, but to give a drink sweetness and balance. I found a copy of Jerry Thomas's How to Mix Drinks or Bon Vivant's Companion, 1862, and some other treasures from the mid-19th century which proved invaluable in helping me reconstruct the methods of the classic era. Thomas's recipes were simple and direct, a base ingredient combined with modifiers. He demonstrated the absolute necessity of using simple syrup in a cocktail program that utilized freshly squeezed lemon and lime juice. This was how he mastered the sweet and sour cocktails like fizzes, sours, and fixes. It was enlightening to read about the methods barmen like Jerry Thomas and Harry Johnson had used to master ingredient, recipe, and technique. The superb craftsmanship and wide variety of exotic ingredients they employed inspired me and wide variety to approach the profession of bartending like a chef. And what better place to reinvent the classic cocktail than the pinnacle of New York's nightlife, the historic Rainbow Room. There's no reason why you can't do it in your own kitchen. So roll up your sleeves, and let's explore the ingredients that we need to make great cocktails. Thanks for watching please leave a comment and hit the like button.